everyone and just the obligatory check. You can see my screen and you can hear me and it's all good. It's all good. Perfect, perfect. Well, yeah, uh, uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, so excited to be able to present in, uh, on this workshop. I, I wish I would be in Paris, but uh, I'll Zoom it is again. Um, and I understand it's probably already pretty late in Paris, so people might get a little tired and uh, I will promise to, to keep it light. So, um, yeah, what, what is a gene drive? So a gene drive is a genetic variant that can be inherited at a higher rate than your typical Mendelian inheritance. So, so you can see in this example, if the red one here is your gene drive allele, and um, so that one is actually inherited to, it's always inherited to the offspring. And typically in a diploid organism, if you have one allele from your mother, one from your father, the probability that you uh, pass on uh, any given one to your offspring is one half, but for a gene drive allele, that is higher. Right? So as a consequence of that, a gene drive allele will actually increase in frequency in the population. And it's almost like a chain reaction. So it will increase at an exponential rate and it can therefore in principle spread through the population really quickly. So people have thought about these gene drives for a while and there's always been, it's kind of like fantasy out there what would happen if we could actually design a gene drive and could introduce a genetic variant in the population that would then automatically spread to throughout the population in like an exponential fashion. And um, that was because there are actually a couple of natural gene drives out there. So there are some examples of gene drives that have actually been able to spread through the whole population. But so this whole topic became like uh, really interesting over the past um, basically like seven years with the introduction of CRISPR because people have realized that we can actually use CRISPR to design a gene drive. And the way how that works would be as follow is that you actually integrate that um, CRISPR machinery into a genome and then program it to copy itself onto another chromosome. So that means if you are a heterozygous individual, so you, you have a uh, one gene drive allele, but uh, in your other chromosome at that same locus, you have the wild type allele. As here with, the, with this, uh, so blue would be the wild type, right? Is the gene drive allele. So the CRISPR would then actually copy itself onto the other chromosome. So we, you become a homozygote for this gene drive allele. And if that process happens in the germ line, now all the gametes of the sperm and egg that you produce, they would always have this gene drive allele. So you would have an allele that would essentially like have this perfect 100% ratio being passed on to offspring as compared to 50% of a regular allele. And um, so you can design that with CRISPR. Now, the first time that I was actually shown, it was in 2015. So these are like the first two papers that were actually able to uh, um, design a gene drive with CRISPR and show in lab experiments that that can work. So this first paper here, at that time, they still call it like the mutagenic chain reaction. And it was a little bit of an unfortunate um, choice of name. And, and nowadays that's no longer used, but, but they showed that you can actually develop this method and that you can effectively or efficiently convert heterozygotes to homozygotes. And then people have, the next step was that people have implemented uh, gene drives, these CRISPR gene drives in mosquitoes. And then the idea is that you can use that to introduce a genetic modification that makes these mosquitoes less likely to transmit malaria. And now if you can couple that with a gene drive, you just release a few of those mosquitoes and this genetic construct would spread exponentially through the population until like everyone has it. And then the population will no longer be able to transmit malaria. So that's one of these applications that people have in mind for these gene drives. Now, the question is how fast would something like this actually work and how would it depend on all sorts of factors, like there would certainly be some kind of fitness cost to these gene drives. And in order to figure that out, you can set up, you can start out with a very simple dynamical model. So let's look just at, at a simple model. We have discrete generations. We look at a pan mythic, that means a well-mixed population in which you have no kind of population structure, spatial or any other kind. And we also assume that there are no variants that are resistant to this drive process in the population. So in that case, you can set up a simple 
um, 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 differential equation here where you look at Q, the frequency of drive alleles in the population, and you can see how that is expected on average to change over time. That will depend on a couple of factors such as the uh, conversion efficiency of this drive allele, so what fraction of homozygotes are actually converted, uh, of heterozygotes are actually converted into heterozygotes, and then the different fitness costs here. So you can say that this drive allele example has some fitness cost, and then there's also the question of, is that a recessive or a dominant or co-dominant fitness cost? So you can have a dominance coefficient in here as well. And you can set up this simple uh, dynamical equation here. It turns out that that already gives rise to some pretty interesting dynamics. So there are different regimes here that depend on the dominance of these costs and the conversion rate of the drive and the fitness cost. And um, so the conversion rate of the drive here is always shown on this x-axis with one meaning like perfect conversion rate. And then the drive fitness cost here on the y-axis with uh, one being that drive has no cost um, and a uh, smaller value that's the the fitness of the drive would be smaller than one, so the, this would be 80% cost here. And you can see that uh, in general, if your conversion rate of the drive is high enough, you're always in this regime where any drive allele that you release in the population, if it overcomes this like initial stochasticity, is expected to actually fix in the population. But if that is lower, and if, if the fitness costs are higher, such as up here, then um, uh, you, you can be in an unstable equilibrium, or here, if you have recessive cost, the drive value could actually be lost, and so on. And you can even have like some regimes in here where you can have stable equilibria in this dynamic. So already, this is like pretty simple system in a well-mixed population, you know, like no other fancy stuff going on, can exhibit quite some interesting dynamics. But the key here is that you know, if the conversion rate is high enough and the fitness cost is not too high of the drive, it is always expected to spread through the population and fix in the population and do that um, in just, you know, like a couple, maybe 15 or 20 generations. And so what, what you, one consequence of that is that this drive mechanism is so strong that you can actually push something through the population that in the end is not good for the population. So that has some fitness cost. And you can look at one scenario here, that's pretty interesting, where you um, drive an allele that actually causes sterility in females when they are homozygous, right? So you can do that, for example, by having this drive here targeting um, a specific haplosufficient gene, so which you need to have two, um, of, of which you, if you have one working copy in the genome, it's fine. But if you have no working copy, then you're actually sterile as a female. So it's pretty straightforward to design a drive like that. But now, when you think about it, this drive, if it goes to fixation in the population, at that point, all the females will be uh, homozygous and they would all be sterile. So the population would actually collapse and would go to extinction. And you can see in modeling here that this is exactly. Uh, what would happen under these like simple models that I showed you before. So this is a plot here where uh, I show the drive frequency versus time here in terms of generations. And this purple curve here, that's one of the female sterile homing drives. The two other ones, those are just two different types of these suppression gene drives that work a little bit differently. But this is just to illustrate that you know, there are several ways of how we can go about this. This x ray here, for example, would be a drive that um, just Choice X chromosomes. So um, therefore, it would lead to all offspring being male, and that would also lead to population collapse. And you can see that each of these drives here, they are expected to go to fixation in these like simple panamictic models in just a couple of generations, like typically 15 or 20 generations. And if you now look at the expected population size here, you see that the population is actually expected to collapse under these drives. Right? So it's not just suppressing the population. These are drives that would be capable of eliminating a population. And if, if you think that's all like um, too fancy and, and would not work, so people have actually achieved that nowadays. So here are two studies, like the first one from 2018, where people designed one of these uh, suppression drives that targeted a specific um, um, uh, gene double sex, and they in uh, Anopheles gambia mosquitoes, and they looked at a large cage of these mosquitoes, like several hundred mosquitoes in 
in there, they release this, this drive at a very low frequency in there at just a, a few percent, and that drive spread through the population and did exactly what the models predicted it to do. So in the end, all the females were sterile in this case and the population was eliminated. And just last year, this was actually shown on, on a much larger scale. So here, um, people did these experiments still in the lab, but in much larger population cages. So here's uh, some picture of these cages. So those were actually cages where uh, people had several, I think there were tens of thousands of mosquitoes in one of these cages. And again, they achieve complete population elimination in these cages by one of these gene drives. So you just release it, it spreads through the population and the population is eliminated. So people are, of course, um, uh, very concerned about this, right? Because on the one hand, um, some people say, well, that's an incredibly powerful technology. Well, let's get rid of certain kinds of mosquitoes, right? And maybe that's worth it. And of course, other people say, well, you have no idea what's going to happen if you do that, right? And the risks are much higher than the benefits. And so there's, there's a lot of discussion, of course, about this, right? And um, so people, some people have called it the extinction invention. And uh, the big question, of course, is, is it uh, uh, too risky to ever use? Well, I don't want to get so much into the uh, ethical debate about these gene drives here. But I want to point out that, you know, in order to think about that, we, we have to get much better understanding of what would actually happen in a real population if you would release them. Right? And one big question is, would, would, it, would the same thing happen as does in these population cages, these small cages where, you know, essentially you have a model that gets pretty close to a panmictic population. So in a sense that, you know, like the mosquitoes are not so far away from each other, they can typically, you know, everyone can still mate with everyone else and so on. If you think about a real world population of mosquitoes, as here uh, for the example of the mosquito Aedes aegypti, um, well, they're spread across like large parts of, of the world, right? So they live in um, a, a much larger landscape. And of course, mosquitoes that live in this part of Africa here, they will not be able to mate with individuals in South, uh, in, in, um, South America, right? So this population structure that you have in a real population, that of course raises some questions. Like it's already clear that in, in this like global population, a drive could not possibly spread through the whole population, just like 15 individuals, right? So there's um, limitation due to migration. And the question is how can you actually model the dynamics that would happen in these populations? So what we and others are interested in is trying to see what happens when you go from these and make the population models to ecologically more realistic models where you have continuous space. And are there the specific things that um, can show up in these continuous space models that um, you would never get in a pandemic population model, and how would they then be expected to um, affect the outcome of a drive release? So if you want to model that mathematically, one um, natural approach when people think about continuous space is to use diffusion models. And this is obviously not an audience where um, I need to uh, stress what a powerful approach diffusion models can be. And we've uh, had like several interesting talks here already in which uh, diffusion models were used. So generally, the idea in these diffusion models then is that you think about the frequency of the drive alleles and you can mod model them with these kind of like traveling waves or so-called Fisher waves. And that would be very, um, um, very similar for a gene drive or a scenario where for example, you would, you would model the spread of a beneficial allele in the population, um, something like that. And actually, a lot of people here um, uh, in the audience and among the presenters, they, they have uh, used these models. And uh, I know that uh, Florence and, and her group have also used them to model gene drives. And uh, I know Nick, Nick Barton has used these models and uh, also. So, um, so that's a natural approach here to do that. But um, Diffusion models are also not the perfect models for um, modeling this kind of dynamics, especially when it comes to these suppression drives. And one um, problem of these models is that, um, um, in essence, they're still kind of deterministic models. Right? So you have this wave that, that moves in kind of a deterministic fashion, and that becomes pretty 
typically, if you look at a two-dimensional model here, like you would always have this radial symmetry and you would just have this kind of like um, circle moving outward at, at a constant velocity. And what diffusion models are not good at is modeling what happens once the population density actually becomes so low that now the action of, in, of uh, specific individuals matters, right? And so that's something that will turn out to be very relevant for these suppression gene drives. You will founder events and, and other types of events that occur at like very low population density, where you know maybe one individual manages to get in a certain area of space and can now um, found a new population there. They will actually become pretty important events, and that is something that diffuse models are not very good at. That that it's, it's really di difficult to capture in these models. So um, the alternative approach that that I will talk mostly about today is um, to study these kind of models with individual based simulations. So those, those are then models where you really model every individual in the population and they move around and they mate and they do all their things and you have gene drives present or not in these individuals and you can model the specific inheritance and then what these gene drives do. So it, of course, gives you much more power to include all sorts of realism, right? But of course, it also comes at a price. In these models, you're... You, you, you can no longer make uh, re analytical predictions, although, you know, that's something that you can maybe try on later. So um, I want to talk about a very um, simple kind of idealized model here for the suppression gene drive. So we look at a model where we just um, um, model individuals in continuous space, and you know, we just assume it's a square landscape. You have males and females there. And one um, important factor that we want to include in these models is that there's local mating. So each female here just has a specific uh, a circle of radius R around it from which it chooses its males. So that's already like one aspect of this, pop this uh, uh, continuous space population structure that we have in there. We also want to model some kind of like local density control. And the way how we do that is that we say there's a density dependent fitness where um, the fecundity of a female depends on how many other individuals are in her neighborhood. So you calculate something like um, a local density factor here, this uh, rho, which says, well, what is your local density as compared to some kind of carrying capacity to the population? So if you're exactly at that um, equilibrium, then your local density factor would be one. And if you're below that, it's smaller than uh, one and you can get all the way to zero if you know there are very few individuals around you, but it can also get larger than one if there are too many individuals. And um, then we have the parameter of the low density growth rate. And if we update the fecundity of each female by this kind of logistic function here, then that should give us some kind of logistic density control here. So in equilibrium, we get that the fecundity in uh, the updated fecundity is what it was before, so it doesn't change. But if you have low density, then it actually is like it's like multiplied by this um, growth, low density growth rate. So you can that parameter beta here can essentially tune at low density how rapidly can the population rebound. So that's a model here for um, for fitness. And then of course the last thing we have to introduce here is some kind of dispersal. So we want these individuals to move around. And the way how we do that is that we say juveniles, they are displaced by a certain just random distance in a random direction from uh, their mothers. Right? And we, in this simple model, we don't move them afterwards anymore. But um, I think this, this will actually, the, what I will be showing next, this will just be discrete generation. So um, this already, this kind of defines the dispersal here. And, you know, you can, of course, think about um, all sorts of different kernels here, like that could be an exponential kernel or so on. But, you know, and, and usually what matters is also just the scale, right? So what is the average dispersal of these juveniles from their mothers? So what I want to show next here is an actual simulation of one of these scenarios. So here's one of our like square landscapes. And I think there are a couple of thousand individuals maybe in this one here. So every white dot is an individual. And so in the middle here, we release a couple of individuals, these red individuals, and they have one of, they have the uh, suppression gene drive. Right? And so it's one of these uh, fertility, uh, 
female fertility homing drive. So where the um, uh, homozygous females for the drive allele are actually sterile. So let's see what happens if we run these simulations here. And it works great. <laughs> All right, so you see the drive allele as expected spats, and then everyone becomes red at some point, and that means all the females will be homozygous for these drive alleles, and the population collapses. So you get here what you expect, the same behavior as in this pandemic population model. Now here is the next simulation, and I just changed this beta parameter a little bit more. Why was that doing the same? Oh, I see. I actually have to go to the next slide. Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, so this is the new simulation. So what I do for this new simulation is just I change this um, beta parameter, this uh, low density growth rate to some higher value. So this is a population now that, you know, if there's low density, the wild type can actually rebound at a faster rate. And let's see what, what happens during these simulations. So again, the gene drive spreads, but now you see that when the population density gets very low, you see that there are these wild type individuals rebounding, and then they get what we call chased again by these drive individuals. It's this constant kind of like game of catch up here, right? Where the drive always tries to catch up with the wild type individuals, but because the wild type individuals can so quickly expand when, when they are in an area where there are no drive alleles and where there are a few other individuals, you end up in this kind of coexistence dynamic. So this is actually a really powerful drive that in a pan-nictic model would always uh, result in complete population elimination in just a few generations. But now you have this spatial model here and the drive doesn't succeed. So the population always rebounds and we call it this kind of chasing dynamics. That is the same one. So, okay, so here, um, I think this is just, oh, this this is just one. What, 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 there was just another one of those little videos. So I, I like to look at these. I, I, I always find it kind of like mesmerizing how it works. Um, so these kind of like dynamics that in a spatial model lead to coexistence, um, that's actually been seen in like many other systems as well. Like here's just an uh, example from um, uh, E. coli different species of E. coli that in, um, compete with each other and they kind of lead to this dynamics. And here was actually, they tried to map this onto like a spatial game of rock, paper, scissors. And um, that's an analogy that I also found quite helpful to what we see in these gene drive models. So here there's three agents with that, which actually be empty space, um, areas with mainly drive alleles and areas with mainly wild type individuals. And you see how it would lead to the cycle where, you know, the drive would always convert the wild type alleles. And then the empty space would be the outcome of if there are only drive alleles. And then, um, the, uh, in the, but the wild type individuals can invade the empty space. So you end up in this kind of cyclical dynamics and in space that can lead to a really interesting outcomes. Now we next wanted to See, can we quantify this a little bit better? And, and can we see what are the, the parameters that determine whether you have chasing? So we wanted to be able to detect chasing in our simulations. And um, it was with a pretty ad hoc approach where we look at the clustering in the population in comparison to the population size. And this clustering measured by what's called a green, uh, green coefficient. So essentially how that works is you um, uh, split up the space into different cells and you look at what is the variance in cell counts between these cells and um, if you would have a simple like Poisson process with a uniform distribution here the variance uh, should be the same as the mean so this green coefficient here uh, would be zero and if it, the variance is larger then it would be larger than zero so it's a, effectively a measure of clustering and I'm showing that here um, over the course of time, one of our simulations, so that green curve here is the green's coefficients, and that uh, black curve here is the overall population size. And you see initially, when the drive spreads, the population size goes down. Green coefficients go up, so there's more clustering. But now you have the population size rebounding, and green's coefficients goes down again. And you see that it, whenever we see that, it's, it's like a very characteristic pattern that we can actually use to um, detect chasing just with these 
two measures in an automated way. And so with that, then we wanted to know, well, how does the probability or the frequency of chasing, so among simulation runs or a given set of parameter values, how does that depend on these parameters? And uh, so the first part I want to show here is the uh, chasing frequency as a function of the low density growth rate and the dispersal rate. And so these blue areas here, those are the areas where you have a lot of chasing and the white ones here, that's where you have zero chasing. So you see chasing mostly happens if your dispersal rate is low and if the low, low density growth rate is high. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because the dispersal rate is essentially a parameter you could tune to switch between a panmictic population model and a maximally structured model. So the higher the dispersal rate, the more mixture you have in the population. So the more it resemble a panmictic population, and for this drive, uh, there's the population should then always uh, the drive should always succeed and eliminate the population. Um, here is a plot that shows how um, the frequency of chasing is impacted by drive parameters. In this case, the drive homozygote fitness, and uh, I need to clarify here. So this is the fitness cost in males because the females that are homozygous for the drive they will actually be sterile so they will always have a zero fitness right but if there are no fitness cost in males right the drive can still work and even if there's some fitness cost in males it can still work and here's the drive efficiency so you see the more efficient a drive is right and uh, the lower the fitness cost so the closer this fitness here is to one the uh, less chasing there is but you see that once the drive it's not, not like there's a certain threshold here, right? And below that efficiency of the drive, you always see a lot of chasing. And the last thing here is we uh, want to look at how does inbreeding affect the chasing frequency. So we came up with a model in which we um, uh, facilitate inbreeding in the population. And then we can also tune what the fitness effect is of this inbreeding with one meaning that uh, inbreeding doesn't reduce your fitness at all, but uh, this zero would mean that you have a very much reduced fitness in inbred individuals. And you see that here, the chasing is the highest in these areas where you have a high inbreeding level and you have also a big fecundity cost due to inbreeding. And that again, makes a lot of sense. So a, a last thing that I want to point out here is these were all models in which you don't have resistance coming up. So um, now I want to show a simulation here in which uh, resistance can also evolve. So you have one of these chasing scenarios. And now because you have this coexistence of the drive alleles and wild type alleles, now there, there's a lot of time for resistance evolves in the population. You will see that, that at some point here, you will just have yellow alleles spreading through the population. And those are resistances. Now they come up here. And then of course, it, when they take over, they will just displace the drive from the population, right? So you essentially then get to a new state in which everyone in the population is just resistance and uh, resistant and the drive is actually, the drive wheel is actually uh, gone from the population. Oh, all right, so um, this was all a pretty abstract model. Um, the last thing I want to show here is um, a somewhat more concrete model and that is um, um, motivated by, um, uh, the Predator Free 2050 project, which is um, a project in New Zealand, which have this like, pretty ambitious goal that they actually, they want to, they have a big problem with uh, invasive rodents and some in, uh, other invasive species that, you know, have not existed in New Zealand, what were brought there over the past few hundred years and, and are now a big threat to a lot of their native species, like, for example, their like, national animal, the kiwi bird. And uh, so they have this ambitious goal. Of, they want to get rid of a lot of these invasive um, predators that have been introduced in New Zealand and are causing a lot of havoc there. And they actually approached us and, and funded us to do a modeling study of whether it's possible to use suppression gene drives against invasive rats on some of their islands. And that's like one application where, you know, there's still a lot of ethical concerns, but at least if it is on an island and if, if you can assure that the individuals cannot leave that island, then you know one, one might think that may be an application where you could think about a controlled gene drive release. Although you know I and others still have a lot of questions about that, but still the question is: could, could something like this even work? So 
for this, we set up um, a much more sophisticated model. Um, and that's a model of the invasive rats on an island population. And so this model here is a much more complicated life cycle where, where we try to emulate the, the um, uh, rat life cycle as much as possible. So it ends up actually being a, a 13 parameter model with these eight parameters here related to um, the demography and ecology of those rats and um, five parameters uh, related to the specific gene drive that you want to release there, such as like the fitness, its efficiency, resistance rates, and so on. And also among these ecological rates here, there are a couple of processes that just make things um, quite a bit more complicated. So these are non-overlapping generations, their litter sizes, there is something like an itinerant frequency, which means that um, you know in every at every time there's a certain fraction of individuals in the population that actually move around, whereas the other ones primarily stay put in place and so on. So you, you see it's a much more, um, it's quite a bit more realistic, but therefore also a much more uh, complicated model. And of course, the, the parameter space of this model now is huge, right? And if you want to understand what's going on in this model, you run into a big problem, and specifically that each run, when you slim for these kind of populations here, that the model, like uh, let's say maybe like 100 generations or so of this gene of an, in a rat population, they can easily have like hundreds of thousands of individuals. It'll take about one minute to just over an hour. But then again, to look at the outcome, of um, these releases, which we typically classify as was there success or elimination of the population in a certain period of time or not, you have to average over a number of runs, and we typically average over about 20 runs here per data point. So if you just want to look at two parameters, right, and want to make a heat map or over a grid of these two parameters where you vary them across 50 steps each, and you look at these run times, that alone would take about 50,000 CPU hours, right? And now that just tells you something about two parameters. And remember, there's 13 parameters in this model. So if you want to get a better understanding, two parameters don't help you much, right? If you change another one, maybe that already completely changes everything here. So ideally, what we would want to be able to do is we want to be able to do some kind of sensitivity analysis, right? Where we can understand which parameters contribute more to the output um, than others, right? And Ideally, we would also want to look at interactions of these parameters, but it is clear to do that kind of sensitivity analysis, like with such a 30 parameter model, that will require tens or hundreds of thousands of data points easily, right? if, if not many more. So how can you approach a problem like this? And one approach that we became interested in and wanted to look at was to use machine learning for this question and in a specific sense. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a meta model, a machine learning meta model that can predict the outcome in terms of suppression um, or uh, failure rate of a drive release for a given parameter setting. So the machine learning would be trained on our simulations, right? But it would, um, it would then from that build a meta model that we, we hope will be an accurate representation of the true outcome. And then we can interrogate this meta model, right? And do a sophisticated sensitivity analysis there. So, you know, it might be a pretty um, unrealistic goal, right? But we try to do it anyways. And so the approach that we decided to use was that we um, implemented this meta model as a Gaussian process. And um, uh, it's one of these machine learning techniques that um, you may not have heard so much about, like it's not, you know, one of these like fancy things like neural networks and so on. Um, but it is actually what I believe for, for this approach of the by far most powerful approach. And it's not one of these black box approaches like, like a lot of the other ones. So this is actually completely analytically tractable. Everything is described in terms of Gaussian random variables. And you can use that as a regression approach that can act as an interpolator between sparsely sampled data points. And one reason why we were so interested in this is that this Gaussian process doesn't just make predictions, but it also includes uncertainty information regarding its predictions. So it knows in which areas of the parameter space it knows a lot and in which areas it doesn't know a lot. So because of that, you can train it adaptively. So you can go into these areas where the model now doesn't yet know a lot, 
and think there's something interesting going on there. And then you can adaptively train it for those areas. So you can recalculate the model and see, okay, has it improved my situation? Right? And where are still areas in the parameter space that I need to know more about, that I need to probe better? So this way of adaptively training, of course, that can give you a solution to some extent of this like any parameter problem, right? Because even though you have 13 uh, parameters, it might still be that like large spaces of the parameter space are very boring. Right, in a sense that nothing really happens there, right? And so it might still be only a few areas that you really need to understand. For example, where you have these transitions from every suppression all the time to failure all the time. And the other cool thing is with these Gaussian processes, um, because they're, they're uh, fully um, analytical, you can do very efficient sensitivity analysis directly on these Gaussian process models. So once it's trained, you can immediately do something like Sobel sensitivity analysis, and it takes no time whatsoever. So here's a, just a, a quick illustration of how that works. So X here is, let's say, your parameter, right? Fx, uh, F is your um, um, the variable you're interested in. So maybe that is the success rate, right, of the drive, and maybe that is the uh, uh, drive fitness or something like that. So you have some true function here, that like blue curve, and you have some sparse observations, these points here. And so the Gaussian process now makes a prediction of this function. And it also knows like what's it, what, what its confidence interval is and what the certainty is here. So we use this approach to train on our simulation model. And we were surprised by how well that worked. So with uh, just like about 20,000 simulations of adaptive training, the Gaussian process arrived at a point where it says, I'm like pretty confident about but uh, most things, like, you know, there are different ways of how, how you can quantify the accuracy with, you know, precision and recall or routing, squared error, squared error, and so on. But um, it was at a level where we said this, is, this seems like very useful for us. And I just want to show that here in like one example. So off this trait model now, we can look at, for example, what is this prediction for dive success? Like 100% would be blue, 0% uh, would be red, and then you have some in between area here where you now you have drive success in, in between one and 19 of, you know, like 20 simulations. So that would be in between. And so the, the colors you show what the Gauss model predicts, and then we verified that with actual simulations. And you see for this simple 2D slice of that parameter space, it's actually really good. It gets this like boundary here exactly right. And this is not a trivial model, right? It's not just a line or something, but it actually has, has some interesting shape to it. Um, so, so we looked at many of these plots and just convinced ourselves that the model was actually able to understand and predict this like much more complicated ecological simulation model with pretty high accuracy, right? And so then we took that Gaussian model and um, did this sensitivity analysis. And that's the last thing I want to show here. Um, and it, Essentially, so this is a soil type sensitivity analysis that just shows you the relative contribution of each parameter to the variability of the output. So this is for like three different drives here, female fertility home drive, viability home drive, and Y shredder. And here that's like with resistance for these two, and that's uh, that's without resistance for these two, and that's with resistance for these two. So I just took the picture from the paper here and it might be a little bit more complicated than it needs to. But so what you see now is that there are certain parameters of the model that are important, right? Like the monthly survival rate, the drive fitness, the drive efficiency, or the resistance rate here in this model with resistance. And then there are other parameters that are not so important, right? Like the interaction distance, the island side length, so the size, somehow all of these things are not really, or the release percentage, they're not important at all. And not only does the Sobel sensitivity analysis give you these um, contributions, it also splits them up into first order effects, so the dark blue ones, and then total effects. So total effects is just the total impact of that parameter, but it could also include impact that is due to interactions with other parameters, right? So that is essentially this light blue area here, right? Where the total effects are directly due, this, due to this parameter. So that's interesting, right? Because that can point you towards which interactions might you want to look at, right? A specific parameter in itself might not be so interesting, but once you look at it in combination with another one, it can really um, be important. And you see that now for different types of drives, different things are important, right? For this Y shredder here, the drive parameters are much more important 
than the ecological parameters. But this one is viability, homing drive, the drive efficiency, is still all important parameter. And so when you can do that, now you know if this parameter is important, that also means this is the parameter that I need to learn more about in my population models. Right? So if you want to go out and measure a parameter, that can tell you like which parameter do you need to be very accurate in measuring. All right, so to summarize, um, um, suppression gene drives in continuous space are prone to chasing dynamics, which can prevent population suppression. And that's true even for drives that would always eliminate a pandemic population. And likelihood of chasing depends on drive, demographic, and ecological parameters of the system. Um, and so that all means to accurately predict the outcome of a suppression drug release. Detailed population models should be used that incorporate realistic levels of population structure on large scales. And lastly, a uh, caution process machine learning approach can create meta models for complex gene drive simulations, thereby facilitating sensitivity analysis. All right, so um, that's all I, I, I wanted to say. Sorry, I'm a little over time. Um, uh, so you may have wondered if you saw some of these papers, there were a lot of Champer papers and uh, that's because I'm so lucky I actually uh, had two Champers in my lab. So Jackson Champer, he was a postdoc. He's now um, uh, a faculty at the University of uh, Peking. And Sam Champer, he's uh, his brother and he's a grad student in the lab. And he's about Kim, Nathan, all uh, um, Rob Uncles and, and uh, Andy Clark. So with them, I collaborated a lot on these projects and uh, also thanks to our funders. Uh, thank you for your um, uh, patience and uh, I'm happy to take questions if you have. Thank you, Philip, uh, for this interesting talk. Is there any question? Yes. Um, thank you, thank you. It was really uh, also an amazing talk it was really great um, I have uh, uh, two little questions the first one is um, um, if I understand well doing experiments on island gives only a very uh, partial information on what could happen at a large scale and I understand that if you do it like on a continent you will always find the kind of coefficients that lead to uh, these uh, chasing dynamics and evolution of resistance so this seems to be a, a bad thing uh, is it correct or not? And, and the second thing is, uh, could we imagine that once uh, the wild type has been uh, wiped out, you could have another species that would uh, partially fill up the, the niche and maybe uh, change a little bit the dynamics? Right. Uh, so um, uh, let's get to the first, first question first. So on, in, in a, let's say, on, on a larger continent, right, um, what, what would happen there? And... Um, whether you always get chasing, I would not say that that's true. Like that, we, it really depends on the specific system you're looking at, the specific species, right? And whether that is a species with like one of these like high low density growth rates, right? What the dispersal is of that species, uh, and so on. So there are certainly um, ranges of parameter space where you don't get chasing, even in like a very large population. Whether resistance is something that will always come up, that's that's another question that, that is really hard to answer at this point. I think for like the current drives that are out there, it's almost always that you will get resistance in a large population. So there's some ideas. Um, so in these cages, they manage to not get it there. So if you look at a few thousand individuals, it might still be possible, but it's like how many mosquitoes are there? You know, like in the wild, even like of some species. So that these numbers are just so large that you know nobody can predict whether there will not be some evolution of resistance coming up. So um, that is something that you can't really predict by modeling, right? You would have to know like what the mechanism is, and then see how likely that is, and what population size you would need um, for that. Um, regarding your second question, what if, if what would actually happen if if you drive a species to extinction? Right, um, that's something that that I don't really feel qualified to answer. Right, I'm 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 probably one of these people that that always argues you should. I hope nobody tries any of these gene drive approaches in the wild uh, um, at the moment or in the near future until we really understand more of these things. Um, I think that my, my personal guess would just be right. That depends a lot on the species. I mean, 
humans are actually eradicating species at, at a dramatic rate at the moment, right? So there are tons of species that we just drive to extinction. So this would be another mechanism, right, of how, and for these other ones, it's unintentional, right? So this would be a mechanism for intentionally driving them to extinction. And I, I could imagine that for some species that might not be a big problem, right? So maybe others will just fill that niche, but then for other ones, uh, it, all hell could break loose, right? So it's, it's really hard again, to make these predictions. And I think ecologists will, will be much more qualified to, to um, ans answer those questions and, and make predictions in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Maybe in the Zoom session? Or here? Hi, Philippe, it's Vincent Calvez uh, speaking. Uh, I'm curious about the, this uh, stochastic effect uh, that, that you showed that are spectacular when you have uh, uh, this chasing. Do you have an insight of... Um, so you, you showed some, some uh, maps uh, in the parameter space where you can uh, distinguish between the two by this measure of, uh, of uh, local uh, variance, but can, can you understand why it happens on, or why not? Or can you sort of identify the, the frontier between these two, uh, these two scenarios? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, qualitatively, uh, to, to some extent, right? So there, um, there, there's some ways of, of how, how you think about this. So, so one observation that, that I didn't really mention here is that like, so chasing actually happens a lot, like the more powerful the drive is, the more chasing you sometimes get. And specifically in terms of like a very fast moving drive, is often much more prone to chasing than one that is just like very slow, but very thorough, right? Because, and that is because um, like the drive still needs, let's say you, you, you model this in terms of like a wave, right? Where the drive wave moves and eats up the population of wild type individuals, right? So in, in this model, like how would you get something like chasing? Well, you would get it if a wild type individual can actually like permeate through that drive wave, right? Or jump over it or something, right? And ends up on the other side. And then there, you know, and it could jump far there and it's far away from any drives. And then there's like a gap in between. So the drive won't even be able to get there again. And now they can grow there, right? So in that case, you should get a lot of chasing and that should be most likely if the drive waves are you know, like pretty thin, what they are for like, you know, like a powerful, fast moving drive. So there, there's some kind of ways of like thinking about that qualitatively. Like we, we did some simulations on that in, in, in 1D space, but um, like pre predicting that analytically is is pretty tough. <laughs>